uh, Paul uh, begins his letter uh, to the church at Ephesus. We are um, uh, trekking through verse by verse uh, through the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, an extremely rich book, both theologically and practically. And, and we are, uh, as we dove into this uh, two weeks ago, but last week specifically, uh, we saw that the Apostle Paul begins this letter to the Ephesians with this explosion of worship. This, this, this Hebrew song of blessing all the way through uh, verse 14. One gigantic uh, run-on sentence. And, and so the Apostle Paul uh, finishes uh, that up by uh, praising God for the blessings that we have uh, in God. Uh, the blessings of the election of the Father, the blessings of redemption in the Son, the blessings of the seal of the Holy Spirit. And now Paul is going to transition from that uh, explosion of uh, worship in song into a, a powerfully, divinely inspired prayer, uh, which he closes chapter 1 uh, out with. And so uh, let's lift this time up to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that Though heaven and earth pass away, your word remains. And we pray that this morning we would make much of Jesus. God, that you would meet us right where we're at. That you would speak to our hearts. That Jesus, your name would be lifted high. That you would be glorified and magnified in this place uh, here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So when I uh, clean the house and occasionally cook, which let me, just, let me just, disclaimer, it doesn't happen near as often as it should, okay? Because I could just, I don't even know where Liz is, but I know she's looking at me. Um, uh, but, but when I do these things, I don't know about you and if you're uh, married here, uh, this morning, when I do these things, for me, like I'm, I'm sort of, kind of looking for some affirmation. I'm looking for some uh, thanksgiving to come from the heart of my wife the moment that she realizes that I, I clean the toilet or I um, wash the dishes or I wipe down the countertops and swept and mopped. And I kind of, I want her to acknowledge that I just uh, did that. Um, it, it, it makes me happy to get that kind of acknowledgement. Uh, from her. And, and I go as far, I don't know about you, but I go as far as to when I do these things and I, and I clean up that mess and I, whatever it might look like, and I know that she's going to come home and she's going to see that and it's going to please her, um, I, can't, I can't wait for her to notice. That's just me, right? So the moment she walks in the door, I'm like, three, two, one. Did you notice there are no dishes in the sink? Go in the bathroom right now. I want you to see it, you know, and then, and, and I, and I want you to tell me how, how great a job I did. And my wife is a very thankful person. And so I, I thank God for her. Um, but there are a lot of thankless jobs, aren't they? Being a mother is a thankless job. Ministry can often be a, a thankless job. Where you work can often, no doubt, be, be thankless as you work extra hard at work, hoping that somebody's going to notice and acknowledge how hard you've worked, that they might appreciate you for how you are going above and beyond uh, for them. Lately, I have felt very appreciated. Uh, lately, I've had church planning networks take me and 20 other pastors to a Knicks game. I'm a diehard Knicks fan. I love it. I'm just like, this is awesome. Thank you. Uh, we just want to do this because we appreciate you. Uh, yesterday, we had a church planning network give us Broadway tickets and a $100 gift card to go uh, get dinner. Just because they wanted to thank us. Just because they said, man, we, we appreciate what you're doing. We see what you're doing. Praise God for what you're doing. And I'm sitting there going, this is awesome. And then we had Julia and Bridget who were like, well, we'll babysit. You know, it's just, 
I have felt appreciated uh, as of late, but regardless of the season you're in, whether you feel appreciated or you, you feel overlooked, you need to understand this, that if you are a Christian, if you are a child of God, uh, Jesus appreciates you. God sees all that you're involved in. God sees the extra mile you go, and he appreciates you. It's sort of a weird thought to try and wrap our minds around because we just, oftentimes, if we're honest, we just think of God as this all-creating, cosmic, all-powerful being in the sky. And we know there's personal relationship, um, but often we, we, we think, if we're, if we're honest with ourselves, that the, the affections uh, can often be viewed as, as, as going one way right? We love you, Jesus. We sing to you, Jesus. But we get uncomfortable when we start to talk about God's affections towards us. Because we know ourselves. We know our hearts. We know what we did last night, right? And so to think that God would appreciate me, that God would be thankful for, for me, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. That's who he penned this letter to. But remember that every word of Scripture is inspired by God. So though, may, though, though Paul may have been writing to a church that existed many, many moons ago, God, who is the author of Scripture, was writing it not just to them, but to you and to I. This book is relevant to, to you and I. It's, it's God's love letter to uh, you and I. God saw the church not just in Ephesus, but God saw the church uh, globally. And so in verse 15 of chapter 1, where we pick up this morning, we read, For this reason, Paul writes, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you Remembering you in my prayers. All of the verbs here in this verse are in the present tense. The Apostle Paul is uh, continually giving thanks for them. This is not this one-off kind of, oh, thank you, you know, as you kind of receive your bag of McDonald's from the driveway, drive through window. This is not just a, oh, oh, thanks for picking that up kind of thing. The Apostle Paul is actively thanking God, not ceasing to thank God for the faith that he had heard of in the church of Ephesus, for the love that he had heard of that this church had one for another. It was an unceasing thanksgiving. He's constantly, earnestly, faithfully praying. And so you ask yourself, what, what motivated a Paul to a pray for them? Because let's be honest. Do we pray for people, friends, family members earnestly? Do we, as Paul and Epaphras throughout the epistles, do we, do we labor in prayer for the people that we love, for the people that are in um, our lives? We often pray for people, right? And, and often it's just kind of like this one-off shotgun prayer to God and then we kind of move on. Um, but can we say that though? Can we say that we're like the Apostle Paul towards the people in our lives? That we, there are people in our lives that man, when we hear of the things that God is doing in their life, we, we pray prayers of thanks, not, not prayers of God, I want this, God give me this, but prayers of thanksgiving for one another. He heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus. He heard of their love for the saints. This is, this is what motivated Paul to pray like this. So Paul does not cease to give thanks. First, because verse 15, he heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, of course, was um, exploding in worship as he, he prayed and praised God for their saving faith. But Paul also prays prayers of thanksgiving for their practical faith. Not just for their saving faith, but for their practical faith. Because he recognized that the church of Ephesus, they were special. They were a special people. 
First and foremost, because they've been chosen and elected and they belong to God, that makes all of us special. But they were special in that they were all out for Jesus. They were not timid. They pressed forward. They went full bore for Jesus. They weren't pew-warming, lukewarm, I guess I'll go to church on Sunday, indifferent believers. That's not the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus was very much so unlike, unlike this gentleman I read of yesterday who, there's a story written of him going to cross the frozen river of St. Lawrence in Canada. And so this guy approaches this frozen river and he's kind of like, okay, do I want to die today? Uh, and so he, he begins to put his hand out and he begins to kind of push on the ice a little bit. And he's like, okay, well, and so he kind of gets on all fours and he begins to kind of gingerly make his way across this river. And he finds himself about halfway across the river when he hears a thundering sound. And he's like, oh, I'm going to go out like this. No, I, unbelievable. And so he kind of turns back and he sees a team of horses pulling a carriage, racing down the road. And his life begins to flash before his eyes. Because the horses don't stop. They, they get past the road. They get onto the ice and they march across the ice. And they are flying. They just fly right past this man. He was shivering in the fetal position. And it says that this man uh, turned a bright red, crimson red, with embarrassment. Because here he was, gingerly making his way on all fours across a river that a team of horses just ran through. How many of us treat our salvation that way? We're just kind of like, oh, I know God saved me, but will he uphold me? Will he keep me? Like it just said in verse 14. Like, is God really going to do that? Is that, is, that, is, that, is that what your relationship with God looks like? The Ephesians knew that Christ had saved them, but they didn't just know that Christ had saved them. They knew that they knew that they knew he would uphold them by the power of his Holy Spirit. And so they were charging straight ahead. And Paul recognized this, and that's why Paul is praying this prayer of thanksgiving, this prayer of praise for what he saw God doing in the life of these people that he loved so much, that he had spent so much time in investing in. Paul thanked God for them because of this. What were they putting their faith in? They were putting their faith in, as we've learned in previous weeks, the goddess Diana, the goddess of fertility. That's where their faith was, past tense. But now, now, they didn't even need to tell you. You just, you heard of their faith. That is the most powerful form of evangelism, isn't it? Like, you didn't even have to open your mouth. Everybody knows there was a radical change in your life. There is, there is gospel gossiping going around. I mean, it's traveling. And people are like, well, so-and-so got saved? So-and-so? No longer worshiping Diana? What? They're on fire for who? Jesus of Nazareth? Paul also does not cease to give thanks for their, look at verse 15, for their love towards all the saints. Don't miss this word, all. Such a critical word, isn't it? That Paul is giving thanks for their love towards not some of the saints, not most of the saints, not the ones that they got along really well with, not, not just the ones that, well, we have a lot in common and we're all musicians, or hey, we're all into sports, or hey, we're all into, um, and, and we've, we've compartmentalized and we've got our little cliques. No, they... they they were being thanked for the love that they had for all the saints. Which is challenging, if we're honest, isn't it? Because it's so easy to be critical of one another. 
It's so easy to be critical of one another because it's so easy to find fault. Because we see the fault in our own hearts and in our own lives and in our own minds and it's so easy to project that on other people. It's so easy to see those same faults in other people and it's so easy to point those things out and yeah, they're cool and all. I know they go to Roots Church, but did you hear what they did on the... It's so easy to be critical. It's so easy to be unloving. It really is. It doesn't take much effort at all to be unloving. But to be loving, not just towards those whom you fancy, but towards those whom you don't have much in common with. That can be annoying. That can be weird. It's, it's, it's those people. It was all the saints. Paul is thanking God because their love for one another didn't just stop at the people that we enjoy their company most. And that's why Paul here uses agape when he speaks about the love that they had for one another. There are a number of Greek words for love expressed all throughout the New Testament, but the word agape is a special kind of love. The word agape um, embraces people regardless of their faults. The word agape is a love that is, it exists not based on one's performance, not based on what they can do for you, not based on what they uh, bring to the table. Agape love wills to love the unlovable. Check this out. Agape love? Agape love is the love that God has for you and I. A love that is not based on how attractive you are. It's a love that we are only able to exercise towards one another because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's the commandment that Jesus gave, isn't it? In John chapter 13. That you would love one another just as I have loved you. Why? Because that's the way the world's going to know you belong to me by the love that you have one for another. Um, and so when, we're, when we're, we're truly, when we as believers in Christ are truly placing our lives in the hands of Jesus, this, this is a natural byproduct of that. When you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, when you are walking with Jesus, when you have intimacy with Him, when you are in, in, in constant fellowship with God, listen, it's a natural byproduct. He is going to begin to mold you and shape you more and more, to be more and more like Jesus. In verse 16, he says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Because of their faith, because of their love, he is remembering them. How do you choose to remember one another? How do you choose to remember one another? Do we get excited about the testimonies of faith and love in one another's lives? Do we rejoice at the spiritual accomplishments of other people? And ch Listen, do we praise God for what God is doing in other churches? So you know there are other churches that exist outside of us. Do we, but but do, are our hearts... Hearts that praise God for what He's doing in, in, in the lives and in the, in, the, in the life of other churches, even those right around us? Because it should be. That should be our heart. Because we are one extension of God's body, but God's body is universal. It's big. It's global. One of the biggest problems that we have relationally in the church, I believe, is that we, we, we don't choose to think the best of one another. We don't, choose, we, we don't give the benefit of the doubt, right? We, we oh, they're late, it's probably because of this. Well, so-and-so did that, well, let me tell you why he did. We, we all, we don't, this is one of the biggest pieces of, of, of merit, marital advice, marital counseling I could ever give a couple. Think the best of one another. Because it's so easy to jump to a conclusion, to, to constantly think the worst. Well, you always do it, so of course I thought you were going to do it again. Okay. Are we not striving for change? Now Paul begins his petition here 
What's the, what's the nature of his prayer? What's involved in his prayer? What's the, what's the characteristic of his prayer? Look here, first it involves knowing him. Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. It's all about knowing Jesus. It's all about knowing Jesus. Jesus. When the New Testament speaks, and it speaks often of, of knowing Jesus, it's talking about a saving faith. A saving faith. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, said as much. And this is eternal life that you know that you are that you know the, the, the only true God and Jesus whom you sent. And we know. Colossians 2, 3, that all treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Him. What does knowing Christ involve? Because it's easy to just talk about ooh, knowing God. What does it involve? It involves more than just knowing facts about Him. You understand that, right? Because there are certain people, they'll go to church their whole lives. Their whole lives. And like those in Matthew chapter 7 will stand before God and Jesus will say, many of you call me Lord, Lord, and yet I never knew you. What does it mean to know God? It's more than just knowing facts and memorizing verses. I know a lot about Patrick Ewing. He's my favorite basketball player of all time. He was born in Kingston, Jamaica. Seven foot tall. He was drafted number one overall by the New York Knicks in the 1985 draft. He never won a championship. We were robbed many years. College. <laughs> Did win in college, praise God. <laughs> and in high school and every other Olympic that he was in. However, I don't know Patrick Ewing. I don't know him. I'd like to know him, to be <laughs> honest with you. But I don't know him. I know a lot about Patrick Ewing. I actually stole his biography as a little kid from the library of my school. I know a lot about Patrick, but I don't know him. And there's a difference between having this intellectual ascent, uh, ascension. I've, I've just, I, I know so much and I've, I've gained so much wisdom. I've gained so much knowledge about a specific individual. It doesn't mean you know him. There has to be a, a mutual knowledge, right? There, there has to be a mutual exchange. And typically, many who are religious, who, who believe they are Christian, uh, do not know Jesus. I am not trying to get you to doubt your salvation here this morning. If you are saved, you are saved. He's given you his spirit. You have that seal. But there are those who go through the motions and they, they come to church on a Sunday to tick a box. They know of God, but they don't know him. And so the question you should ask yourself today is, do I really know him? Is there an intimate exchange between uh, me and the Lord? The Ephesian church, they knew Christ. And yet the Apostle Paul's prayer for them is that they would know Him still more and more. That, that the, their depth of understanding would not stop growing. That it would become more and more full. That's God's heart for you, you know. That is amazing that you have met the Lord. It is amazing that you have been saved. It is amazing that God has given you His Holy Spirit. It is amazing that He's given you purpose and a call. But God wants you to know Him more, deeper, more full. Paul said in Ephesians 3.10 that I might know Him. So when we, when we approach the Scriptures, when we, when we read the Bible, we should have an eye to know Him more. When we spend time in, in prayer, we should approach that time in prayer with a hunger to know Him more. 
when we listen to sermons or podcasts, we should have a thirst to know Him more. Ever growing in our understanding and our depth of the love and the grace and knowledge of who Jesus is. Paul's prayer involves, furthermore, spiritual vision. Verse 18. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Paul goes from encouraging us to have better knowledge of who God is to better vision. Verse 18. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. The heart is, is the core. It's the nexus of who we are. It's the, the seed of the will. Paul is asking that our spiritual center be, get, be given spiritual vision to perceive, to comprehend, to see. See, we need more... We need more than our physical eyes open. We need our spiritual eyes open. We, I mean, we sing songs like, Open the eyes of my heart. Really? But do we really mean what we're singing? Do we really understand what we're singing? See, because remember, King Zedekiah's eyes were gouged out by the king of, of, of the Babylonians. And then when he was brought, when he was taken to the fabled city to see its majesty, he could see nothing. How many of us see nothing of the majesty of God? Because our spiritual vision is lacking. You don't need more truth. You don't need better truth. You have the truth. And his name is Jesus. Paul is, is praying. Uh, his, his prayer then moves to calling. Verse 18. That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What is the hope of our calling? What is the hope of our calling? Paul prays for spiritual vision so that we might perceive. Spiritual vision so that we might perceive the living hope that we have, 1 Peter chapter 1, in Jesus. That we, might, that we might see that living hope, the hope of the Father's election, the hope of the Son's redemption, the hope of the promise, the seal of the Spirit. That verse 18, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? Paul has already told us that Jesus Christ is our inheritance. We know that, we get that, we've read that, we understand that and it's very easy for us to embrace, isn't it? That as Christians, we have put our faith and trust in Jesus. Jesus is our inheritance. Here's the part we struggle with. Paul's now telling us that we are his inheritance. That you and I are his inheritance. Some of you are sitting here right now going, just please move on to the next verse. I'm having a hard time with this one, right? Because again, we know ourselves. We know our hearts, we know our minds, we know our thoughts. We, we know ourselves pretty well. And for, for me to know how a sinful I can be, for me to try to wrap my mind around the fact that I am His inheritance, that's challenging if I'm honest with you. We are the riches and glory of His inheritance. We, we, we often look at people and, and, and we don't see much worth. When we look in the mirror, perhaps, we may not see uh, much worth. But God looks and God says, there is the riches of my inheritance. What makes you special? What makes me so special that I would be the riches of his inheritance? I began to write a list. And then I quickly realized that what makes me special is Jesus. It's, it's Christ in me, the hope of glory, Colossians tells us. Jesus is why I'm special. 
Yet it's humbling to know that when God looks at me, I'm, I'm precious. I'm, I'm the riches of his glory. I'm his treasure, Deuteronomy chapter 26 tells me. It's such a humbling thing to try to wrap your mind around, especially when you struggle with things like self-worth and you wrestle with things like shame and you battle against guilt. You're precious. You are the riches of his inheritance. Uh, memorize that verse, okay? Meditate on uh, that verse. F.F. F. Bruce, a great commentator, writes, Paul prays here that his readers will appreciate the value which God places on them. His plan to accomplish his eternal purpose through them as the first fruits of the reconciled universe of the future in order that their lives may be in keeping with the high calling and that they may accept in grateful humility the grace and the glory thus lavished on them. Think about that. The king of the universe, the creator of all things, the God who's created the galaxies, the God who's got a cattle on a thousand hills, the God who has an abode in heaven where the streets are gold. If you've ever read in Ezekiel or Revelation of the, the picture of what heaven is like and you think of all of the, the glorious treasures that God has stored up for himself and then you... And then you shift and realize that we are his prized possession. That we are his glorious treasure. The redeemed are worth more than the universe. And Paul prays that we would have eyes to see this. It's my heart, my prayer that we would have eyes to, to see this that our identity would be found in this and not in who we think or others say we are. And what is the immeasurable greatness, verse 19, of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. Paul is not, Paul's not praying that God would, would give them this power, Paul is praying that we would understand that we already possess this power. Not God, please uh, give them this power, but God, help them to understand that they, they possess this power. Paul is stacking synonyms upon synonyms upon synonyms throughout this verse to help us to realize the power that we have as children of God. The power that we have living in us, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that gives us the ability to be more than conquerors. To see the chains of sin and bondage in our lives broken. To take us who are a fallen human beings and, and to, to transfer us as children of darkness into children of light. That is the power of God that lives in us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He gives us all things pertaining to life and godliness. And in these last few verses that we'll just read through here, Paul now talks about, he elaborates on the powers of God in Christ Jesus. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might, Verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
There couldn't be a greater example. There could not be a greater illustration than Jesus Christ himself. The cornerstone of Christianity found right here. What, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Notice that he does not bring the attention towards God's power and strength in creation. He doesn't draw the attention towards God's great power and majesty and how he parted the Red Sea or how he made the sun stand still. But he draws our attention to the power that we have because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Are you tapping into that power? While serving in Spain, we had a lot of power issues in the church there. It was built to be a club. We took it over. All right, it became a church. Um, oddly enough, the wiring was terrible, which is very common in Spain. And so um, what would end up happening is lights would just go out, right? Air conditioning going out. You don't know heat until you go to Mallorca, okay? <laughs> Blistering heat in the middle of the summer. ACs go out. Old ladies passing out. It was crazy. Seriously, we stop in services and we're kind of CPR, not that far. But, um, but the worship team halfway through their set, <laughs> that's just the sound would just cut. It was, it was terrible. And so I had to then meet with a, a brother from the church there um, who uh, spoke little English and I spoke little Spanish, but we drew a lot and we, you know what I mean? We, uh, I brought interpreters sometimes. Um, but his job, what the church was paying him to do, was to then uh, rewire the entirety of the church. The problem, Jimmy, is that it's the, it's the spine of the church is causing the fingers and the toes not to work. And he did this whole kind of explanation thingy to me, and I'm like, all right, we'll fix the spine, please. <laughs> spine replacement, let's do this. Uh, and so he did it. And we're like, praise God, no more issues. Sunday morning, lights, AC, sound. I'm thinking... How much did we pay this guy? You know, and so uh, we had a, a big meeting, which I was uh, super happy about, uh, where we got to sit down and I got to go, dude, what is, what's going on? I need you to show me what you've done. And so very first socket he pops, we go to the power source, opens this thing up, and, and he didn't connect it. The entire church was rewired but was not connected to the power source. That is a picture of many of our lives. We were saved by grace through faith, and yet we are not tapped into the resurrection power that we have in Jesus Christ. We are not dependent on His Spirit to empower us to all that He's calling us to. The untold resurrection power, the untapped power, not only did he raise Jesus Christ from the dead, but verse 20, he seated him at his right hand, speaking of uh, the highest position of authority. Seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, speaking of, of Jesus' exaltation. Well, why, why would the Apostle Paul bring this up uh, in this prayer? Well, first of all, so that we can have a greater understanding of who Jesus is. That He is the exalted Christ, but also so that we, the reader, we, the believer, we, those who are being prayed for and over, would also understand what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, which is that um, He is exalted and so then are we. One day there will be a transformation and it will come to us practically. 1 John 3, 2, when he appears, we will appear like him. And Jesus has been, um, he has been seated at his right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21, far above all rule and all authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Now, listen. I don't know if you realize this. But 
but all things are under the authority of Jesus. Uh, Jesus rules. Jesus reigns. Jesus is all-powerful. And it is at his name that every knee will bow. At the name that is above every name, every knee will bow on earth and in heaven and recognize Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father, Philippians 2 tells us. Every knee, every tongue, to the name that is above every name. That includes your philosophy teacher. That, in, that includes Richard Dawkins. Th that includes any kind of smart person that thinks they've got it all figured out. That includes every a terrorist, that includes every dictator, that includes every government official, every president, every king, every queen. Everyone will bow the knee to King Jesus, the exalted King of kings, the exalted Lord of lords. Every knee. And for some of you, I may have shared this with you before, but I will never forget the day that I um, stood outside the church in Spain in a a gentleman who had had a little bit too much to drink had come and asked for some food and so we fed him and we uh, prayed for him and we um, kind of encouraged him and, um, and as we uh, shared with him the good news of Jesus, we, we, uh, he got a little agitated and, and he responded to our sharing uh, by um, yelling at us, um, I'll never bow the knee. I will never bow the knee. And all there was left to be said was to look him in the eyes with a heart of compassion and to tell him, sir, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You could either do it now or later, but you will do it later. <clears throat> and he went his way and I don't know what uh, came of him. But the reality is this, you and I, we don't make the rules. Jesus Christ is the name above every name. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. What is his position? He is head of the church. He is head of the body. That is who uh, Jesus is. He is the creator of the universe, John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. And I want to close by reading you this quote from Kent Hughes. It's actually a story he tells of Sir Isaac Newton. If you don't know who that is, look him up. Where you been? It says, Sir Isaac Newton, it is said, had an exact replica in his house. Okay, he's a bit much, this guy. Um, of our solar system made in miniature. And at its center was a large golden ball representing the sun. And revolving around it were smaller spheres attached to the ends of rods at varying lengths. And they represented Mercury and Venus and Earth and Mars and other known planets. And these were all geared together by cogs and belts to make them move around the sun in perfect harmony. Okay, this guy's winning the, the science fair. This is incredible. And the thing is, it's, it's mechanical. It's, it's moving around his house. And so one day, as Newton was studying the model, a friend of his who did not believe in God stopped by for a visit. Marveling at the device and watching as the scientist had made the heavenly bodies move around their orbits, the man exclaimed, Mr. Newton, what an exquisite thing. Who made it for you? And he turned to his atheist friend and he said, Nobody. 
No, nobody made it. And his friend asked, Nobody? And he responded, That's right. I said nobody. All these balls and all these cogs and all these belts and all these gears, they just happen to come together. Wonder of wonders, isn't it? By chance, they just began to revolve in their set orbit, all with perfect timing, believe it or not. And his friend got the message. The scriptures proclaim that Jesus Christ is not only a Lord and Savior, but is creator of the heavens and earth. And Kent Hughes would go on to write, by virtue of his creatorship and then his saviorhood, everything is twice his because he made it, then he bought it. What does this mean for you and I? Simply this, that man was made to have dominion over the earth. Psalm 8, you've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, but mankind failed except for one, and that one was the last Adam, Jesus. But for those of us who are in him, we fulfill this psalm with him in his kingdom. We are going to reign with him, rule with him, and be all that we were meant to be in him. We got a good God. It's crazy. You ever think of how blessed we are that we belong to Jesus? Jesus, the absolute sovereign Lord of the universe and the Father assigned Him to be our head. We're the body, we're the arms and the legs and the toes and all the stinky parts. And He has assigned Jesus to be the head of us and we His body. We are so blessed. I hope you realize that. I hope you understand that. Listen, we have this incredible union with, with, with Christ as the head and we as the body, it says there in verse 23. The, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. This is this incredible paradox that exists. That because He's the head and because we are the body, that we also fulfill in Him the, or the fullness of him who fills all in all. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote this, a body needs a head. You can't think of a head without a body. So the body and the head are one in a mystical sense. Thus we are the body and we are part of that which fills up Christ. Where are you with the Lord today? Everybody in this room may be saved. But where are you in your walk with Him? How's that going? What kind of disciplines or practices have you, have you put in your life so that you might be experiencing all that the Lord has for you? Are there some things that, man, after a, a sermon like this, after kind of reading that text and, and beginning to understand... <laughs> Not just all who He is, but all that we are in Him. I know for me this week, as I read through the text quite a bit, I, I, I found myself doing a lot of repenting. A lot of my repenting came from a place in my heart where I recognized, I realized that I had been neglecting so great a salvation. And so maybe this morning, this is a fresh start for you. You're here. You've read it. We've studied it. You get it. Let's do business with Jesus. Whatever it is that God has placed his finger on in your heart here this morning, we ask ourselves a two questions as we now dive into worship. And those two questions are, God, what are you speaking to me? And, and secondly, uh, what am I going to do about it? Father, thank you for your word. 